No one knows exactly how many scientific articles are published every year, but the number is around 2 million. As practicing healthcare professionals, it's your responsibility to stay up to date with new developments in your field of practice. And the scientific journal article is an important way of achieving this. Clearly, you're not going to be able to read all of the research that is published though. So when you sit down to read an article that you think might be relevant, it's important to make the most of that time. One of the many issues that you will face when reading research is that scientific articles are often written incomprehensibly. The authors employ jargon, complex syntax, and overuse acronyms throughout. They can also be quite complex if you're unfamiliar with the experimental design or statistics. And while scientific research typically undergoes peer review before it is published, the peer review process is far from perfect. Mistakes are made, both in research and in the review of that research. So in this video, I'm going to help you tackle all of these challenges. I'm going to discuss how to read and interpret a scientific article. Let's start with the title. While not all studies adhere to this rule, the title of a study in experimental research should give you an idea about the population that was studied, the intervention that was tested, the outcomes that were measured, and its experimental design. Unfortunately, many research articles have ambiguous or misleading titles, but increasingly, editorial policy is to make the title as descriptive and accurate as possible. The first key aspect you should take note from the title is the design of the study. There are lots of ways to design a study to test a hypothesis. Randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials are seen as the gold standard of biomedical research. In these kinds of trials, participants are randomly assigned to either an intervention group who receive the intervention or a control group who receive a placebo. And neither they nor the researchers running the experiment know which participants belong to which group. The thing about RCTs is that they require a huge amount of resources to conduct well. Research on a new treatment or in a group that has never been studied before tends to start small, like in case reports, where a detailed description is provided about individual research participants. Cross-sectional studies are like a snapshot in time, where participants are measured once and compared on a given outcome. Case control studies compare groups retrospectively, say a group who develops a certain disease with one that doesn't, and tries to determine possible predictors of that disease. The next step up in outcome prediction is a cohort study where, instead of looking at people retrospectively, you follow them prospectively over a given time frame to find those same predictors of a given outcome. Importantly, none of these study designs involve the investigators administering an intervention, like in a clinical trial, which is the only way you could infer any kind of causality in research. You've also got studies that seek to summarize other studies that all look at similar groups or interventions. These are known as systematic reviews. A systematic review that applies special statistical analyses to quantitatively pool the results of individual studies is known as a meta-analysis. All of these kinds of study design are summarized in the table on screen. So after the title, you'll see that a paper is divided into sections. Those sections vary between papers, but they usually include an abstract, an introduction, a section on methods, results, and a discussion. The abstract is a brief summary that covers the main points of a study. Since there's lots of information to pack into a couple hundred studies, an abstract often does not make the limitations of an experiment clear or how applicable the results are to the real world. Before deciding to implement any evidence in practice, make sure to read the whole paper. Basing your decision or argument on an abstract alone is not enough. The introduction sets the stage for the study. It should clearly identify the research question in the context of prior research. The authors usually summarize the research in the field and explain why they decided to investigate further. So introductions are often a great place to find additional reading material. That raises an important point. Reading several studies on a topic will provide you with more information about a research question or a hypothesis. In certain areas, particularly where there is a conflict of interest, like if someone is trying to sell you a product, it's common to cherry pick studies to fit a certain narrative. 
For that reason, it's important to look at multiple studies in the field when you're researching a given topic. One way of protecting yourself against this kind of bias is to make your own search for other papers on the topic and to check in on emerging research regularly using that search. Next, the methods, the most important part of the study. A paper's methods section provides further details on the study design I mentioned earlier. The participants who were tested, how they were recruited, what outcomes were used, and whether any treatment or intervention was given. This can obviously vary widely, but in essence, the methods section should be sufficiently detailed that other researchers could replicate the study without needing to contact the authors for more details. You'll need to examine this section to determine the study's strengths and its limitations, which both affect how the study's results should be interpreted. In terms of deciding whether a study is relevant to you or not, often paying particular attention to the population that was studied, like their age, sex, lifestyle, health status, or whether they had any disease or impairment would be a good first step. The larger the sample size of a study, in other words, the more participants it has, the more reliable its results. The demographics of the sample will also play an important role in the external validity of the results. That is, how well the outcome of the study could be applied to other groups or settings. For instance, if a trial only recruited men, then you wouldn't necessarily be able to apply those results to women. Likewise, an intervention tested in young athletes may yield different results when performed on an elderly sample of participants. The demographic information will also mention if people were excluded from the study. Most often, the reason is the existence of a confounder, a variable that would in some way influence the results. For example, if you study the effect of a resistance training program on muscle mass in a group of frail older adults, you wouldn't want some of the participants to be taking muscle building supplements in the background while others didn't, because it might affect your results. Likewise, you wouldn't want some of the participants to exercise outside of the normal protocols of the study. You'll either want all of them to follow the same workout program, or, less likely, you'll want none of them to exercise. The methods section will also describe the intricacies of the design I was talking about earlier. Because there are lots of ways that an RCT, a case control study, or a cohort study can be run. For instance, the methods will provide information about the length of the study, the treatment regimen, the testing methods, and the outcome measures, or endpoints, that were evaluated. To give an example, a study on the effects of a low-level laser therapy regime could use pain as its primary endpoint and function as a secondary endpoint. One trick that researchers do to find an effect, because studies that show an effect are more likely to get published, is to collect many endpoints, then to make the paper about the endpoints that showed an effect, either by downplaying the other endpoints or by not mentioning them at all. To prevent this kind of data dredging or data phishing, an increasing number of journals are pushing scientists to pre-register their studies. The part of the methods that non-specialists often skip over is the last part, the statistical analysis. Determining whether an appropriate statistical analysis was used for a given trial is an entire field of study, and I'm not going to delve too deeply into that field here, but I will try to focus on the big picture. That picture starts with the idea of significance. In research, significant doesn't mean important, it means statistically significant. An effect is significant if the data collected over the course of the trial would be unlikely, if there really was no effect or no difference between groups or treatment regimes. In other words, that the effect observed in the experiment was not due to chance. Basically, researchers run statistical analyses on the results of their study in order to decide whether there was a difference between their groups for a certain outcome or endpoint. They commonly make this decision based on what's known as the p-value of the statistical analysis, and this tells you how likely a result would be if the null hypothesis were true. What's the null hypothesis? Well, in every experiment there are generally two opposing statements, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Let's imagine a fictional study testing a new type of running shoe, Beta Boom, against a traditional running shoe for improving 5km time trial performance 
in a group of track athletes. The two opposing statements would look like this. The null hypothesis would be that, compared to placebo, beta boom does not alter 5k time trial performance. The alternative hypothesis would be that, compared to a traditional running shoe, beta boom alters 5k time trial performance in some way, either positively or negatively. You see, if your research participants ran, on average, one second faster when wearing the beta booms, how would you know whether that difference wasn't down to pure chance? The purpose of the statistical test is to give more certainty about that, about which of the two opposing statements, the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis, is true. When doing that statistical test, the researchers usually set a threshold value of statistical significance, denoted by the Greek letter alpha, before the trial. At the end of the trial, if what's known as the p-value, p, from the results is less than or equal to this threshold, so if p is less than or equal to alpha, then there is a significant difference between the effects of the two treatments studied. Remember that, in this context, significant means statistically significant. Now, there are lots of different statistical tests, and the choice of which to use depends on lots of factors, but the most commonly used threshold of significance is 5%, or an alpha level of 0.05. This means that if the null hypothesis, the idea that there was no difference between the shoes, is true, then after repeating the experiment an infinite number of times, the researchers would get a false positive, in other words, they would detect a significant difference where there is none, at most, 5% of the time. The lower the p-value, under that threshold of significance, the more confident we can be that an effect is significant, that beta boom does alter 5k time trial performance. Though the most commonly used threshold of significance is 5%, or p is less than 0.05, some studies require greater certainty. For instance, genetic epidemiologists would typically set a much lower threshold to infer whether a genetic association is statistically significant. Similarly, researchers who are looking at lots of outcomes in their study because this would be associated with an increased likelihood of finding something by chance, they might adjust the alpha threshold. So for example, they might divide by the number of outcomes they were looking at. Taking the beta boom example, if the researchers also wanted to look at, say, vertical jump height, in addition to performance during the 5k time trial, they might use a Bonferroni adjusted threshold of 0.025 or 0.05 divided by 2. Now a result can be statistically significant, but that doesn't mean the effect is important or meaningful. An effect can be significant but very small. For example, that one second average improvement in 5k time trial performance I mentioned earlier that was deemed to be statistically significant wouldn't really be that relevant to a competing athlete. How can we design an experiment so that it is better able to detect a difference? I mentioned earlier when I was talking about demographics that the larger the sample size of a study, the more reliable its results. Relatedly, the larger the sample size of a study, the greater its ability to find if small effects, like one second, are significant. A small change is less likely to be due to random fluctuations when found in a study with a thousand people, let's say, than in a study with ten people. And this explains why meta-analysis may find significant changes for a given outcome by pooling the data from several studies which independently found no significant changes between similar groups. Finally, keep in mind that while they're important, p-values aren't the final say on whether a study's conclusions are accurate. It's very easy to game the system. Researchers too eager to find an effect in their study may resort to data dredging, or they may also try to lower p-values in various ways. For instance, they may run different analyses on the same data and only report the significant p-values. Or they might recruit more and more participants until they get a statistically significant result. These bad scientific practices are known as p-hacking or selective reporting. Next, we'll go into reading the results. Often, readers will skip right to this section after the abstract, but the results should not be read without first reading the method section, 
knowing how the researchers arrived at a conclusion is as important as the conclusion itself. One of the first things to look for in the results section is a comparison of characteristics between the tested groups. Big differences in baseline characteristics may mean that the two groups are not truly comparable. These differences could be a result of chance or of a randomization method being applied incorrectly. Researchers also have to report dropout and compliance rates in their results. In cohort studies or clinical trials where participants are evaluated over time, it's often the case that the study will start with more participants than it ends with. Dropouts are normal in any longitudinal research, but if there are a particularly high number of dropouts, that would be cause for concern, especially if one group in a trial has a much higher dropout rate than the others. Now, scientists can display the results of questionnaires, time trials, and other methods of gathering data through charts and graphs. But choosing the right method of visualizing data and then scaling that visualization so that it accurately reflects the underlying data is important. At the very least, be sure to check on the vertical axis the scale that is being used. What may at first look like a large change could actually be very minor. The results section can also include a secondary analysis, such as a subgroup analysis or a sensitivity analysis. A subgroup analysis involves in performing the analysis again, but only on a subset of the participants. For instance, if our trial for the beta boom included both male and female track athletes, we could perform our analysis only on the female data to see if we get a different result. A sensitivity analysis is run to check if the results stay the same when you perform a different statistical test or when, as in a subgroup analysis, you exclude some of the data. For example, we could limit our analysis of the beta boom cohort to specialists in the 5k distance rather than the diverse group of track athletes that we initially recruited. But as I mentioned before when I was talking about the demographics of the sample, the reliability of a study depends on its sample size. If we were to exclude some of the participants from our analysis, the sample size decreases and the risk of false positives can increase. It also means that if you play enough with the data, you may eventually get a positive result. This is known as a type 1 error. In the discussion section, the authors tend to summarize the findings and elaborate on the value of their work, the pathophysiology of the injury or impairment, or the mechanism of action of the intervention. Often, they will compare their study to previous ones and suggest new experiments that could be conducted based on their results. Remember, a single study is just one piece of the puzzle. The authors should lay out what the strengths and weaknesses of their study were, and conflicts of interest, if they exist, are usually disclosed after the discussion. Conflicts of interests can occur when people who design, conduct, or analyze research have a motive to find certain results. The most common source of a conflict of interest is financial, when the study has been sponsored by a company, for instance, or when one of the authors works for a company that would gain from the study backing a certain effect. Sadly, one study suggested that non-disclosure of conflicts of interest is quite common in research. And what is considered a conflict of interest by one journal may not be an, by another. And some journals can themselves have conflicts of interest, yet they don't have to disclose them. In any case, don't automatically assume that they don't exist just because they're not disclosed. So to conclude, clearly, going over and assessing just one paper can be a lot of work. Hours, really. Knowing the basics I described here should help, but when it comes to actually reading the article, it's useful to have a system. So to finish, presented on screen is the four-step approach I use when reading an article, keeping in mind all the things I mentioned earlier. You can download it using the link below. <laughs>